Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, as usual. No music intro, fanfare, or anything. Don't send me money or buy my book. I'm just here once again to bring you another nugget from the past 5,000 or so years of Chinese history. Today we look at Guan Yu, the history of and the myths behind this legend of Chinese history and culture. I was with my homies from Ningbo last week, and we had an appointment downtown, so I took them to lunch in the old Chinatown, and we walked around after a nice dim sum at Ocean Seafood on Broadway. This is in L.A. And I bought a, uh, a Guan Yu statue at some gift shop for eight bucks, and when the owner wasn't looking, I snapped a photo with my phone of the altar inside his shop, which, of course, prominently features Guan Yu. You could see this on my China History Podcast website as the featured photos that went along with this episode. This is about as typical a shrine to Guan Yu as you could find. And you can't speak of Guan Yu without speaking also of Liu Bei and Zhang Fei. This is the history part. You see, Guan Yu was very much real. He was a historical figure who later became a god. So we'll look at the historical aspect of Guan Yu, and then we'll look at all the myths and powers contained in his being when he went from being Guan Yu to Guang Gong and Guang Di. Let's first look at the historical Guan Yu. And to do that, we have to jump back 1850 years to 162 AD. These are the closing years of the Eastern Han Dynasty. The Western Han, running from 206 BC to 8 AD, followed by Wang Mang's brief Xing Dynasty from 9 to 23 AD. And then the Han is restored, but the capital is moved to the east to the city of Luoyang, and as you no doubt recall from the previous episodes on the Eastern Han and the Three Kingdoms, the end came in 220 AD and China crumbles like it often did in between dynasties. And after a period of consolidation, China is later divided up into the kingdoms of Shu, Wei, and Wu. In this period, of course, immortalized in Luo Guanzhong's late 14th century book, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. This period in China runs 60 years from 220 to 280 AD. And then Sima Yan unified China and ushered in the Western Jin Dynasty in 265, a dynasty that was not fated to last long. So the historical Guan Yu, he lived approximately from 162 to 220 AD. This means he dies right at the end of the Eastern Han but let's not get too far ahead. Now let's set the scene here, and I'm going to review some of the events of CHP 20 and 22. One of the things that characterized the Eastern Han Dynasty, especially in the waning decades, was the domination of the imperial court, and thereby the government, uh, by the eunuchs. They ran everything and were omnipotent in China. Everything from the top down felt the effects of their greed and perfidy, and to show heaven was totally not happy with things going on in the imperial court, this was also a time of more natural disasters than usual. That was usually a dead giveaway. So times were tough. The common lao bai xing were suffering, and the government wasn't doing their job, and not earning that mandate of heaven. And when the government's laying down on the job, that's when people get desperate and take desperate measures to ensure their survival. And one of these things that people turned to were cults and all kinds of these fringe beliefs where they sought solace. And in 184 AD, sure enough, the Yellow Turban Rebellion, the Huang Jing Zhi Luan, picks up steam and the emperor is forced to take action as the imperial government's very survival was in danger. And if the emperor fell, so went the eunuchs. So, like the foreign powers almost 17 centuries later, they had a vested interest in propping up the emperor and maintaining the status quo. The army was split up with one faction led by the eunuchs, controlling half the army and the other half being controlled by the professional military men. And of course, they turned on each other at once and the eunuchs lost out. They were defeated. And in 189, the emperor dies without an heir. And the most powerful guy left standing at the time was none other than Cao Cao, Cao Cao was, by the final years of the Eastern Han, the most powerful and successful warlord of his day. He had the emperor in his back pocket. 
Cao Cao rose to power in his handling of the yellow turbans. Well, pretty much from the time of the suppression of the yellow turban rebellion until the Eastern Han took its last breath. It was a period of legendary battles, alliances, broken alliances, and in the end, the Eastern Han fell, and then China gets divided up into, ultimately, three states or kingdoms. And again, that is the state of Shu in the west, Wei in the north, and Wu in the south and east. And these states are called also called Shu Han, Cao Wei, Sun Wu. So that's all the backdrop to the historical life of Guan Yu. Like the topic of last week's podcast, Bo Yi Bo, Guan Yu also came from the province of Shanxi. He came from the southwest of the province, from the present-day uh, city of Yuncheng. And this is perhaps a three-hour car ride from the historic city of Xi'an. Guan Yu had a normal, classical upbringing, having read all the great works of the day that allowed one to call himself literate. As the legend goes, there was a local despot named uh, Liu Xiong, who Guan Yu had a hand in killing. And he had to flee his hometown, and he heads northeast and winds up in present-day Zhuozhou, which is just southwest of Beijing. And it's here where he meets the man who will change his life. Here in Zhuozhou, he meets Liu Bei, who one day will head the western state of Shu, or Shu Han. Liu Bei was in the vicinity recruiting men to fight in his army. This is around 198 D. The yellow turbans are causing all kinds of destruction and whatnot in China. So Liu Bei is gathering an army, and it's under these conditions that these three men, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and the other one, Zhang Fei, join together and swear a sacred oath. Zhang Fei was a butcher in the uh, city of Zhuozhou. Now this swearing of this sacred oath, one of the milestone events in Chinese history, most likely it never happened, except in uh, Luo Guanzhong's book, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It happened in a peach tree orchard and has become known as the Taoyuan San Jie Yi, or Oath of the Peach Garden. This whole idea of like-minded men swearing sacred oaths to become brothers and to be there no matter what for the other, it sort of grows out of this. And if you recall from CHP episode 72 covering the Hong Kong triads. This idea of secret oaths and whatnot, it all came from the original three, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, Zhang Fei. And these three formed a great fighting force. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei became the subservient and loyal younger brothers, so to speak, of Liu Bei. The exploits of their battles and how they were so effective as generals make up some of the best stories from ancient China. Zhang Fei, he is portrayed as the epitome of the just and honest man who was both bold and powerful, fighting for justice at all costs. Guan Yu, he stood for loyalty and integrity of the highest order. And this is one of the reasons why Guan Yu is so sacred to the underworld games. One thing about Guan Yu that's instantly recognizable and distinguishes him from the next heroic legend from Chinese history is his red face. He's that god with the red face and that lustrous, long beard. And so these three sworn brothers, they gather an army, and just like they said they would, they go out and fight the yellow turbans, and they're successful in playing their role. And as we know, the yellow turban rebellion was ultimately put down. So Liu Bei, he gets appointed as a governor of a county, and Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, they rise with him, and they serve a series of more powerful military men, and sooner or later, everybody's nemesis becomes Cao Cao. He had the most powerful army and was able to manipulate affairs at, at the center of power. The forces of Cao Cao end up defeating Liu Bei's army at the Battle of Xiapi. Guan Yu is captured in the battle by Cao Cao's forces, and he is, he's treated well, and there begins an interesting relationship where Guan Yu is both captive and a lieutenant serving in the army for Cao Cao. He fights battles for Cao Cao against Yuan Shao, Cao Cao's main rival, but when he gets his chance, ever loyal to Liu Bei, 
Guan Yu heads back to join his other two blood brothers, and from that point on, it was Liu Bei's forces and allies fighting against Cao Cao. And then came the grand alliance with the warlord and the power of the south and the southeast of China, Sun Quan. And from this alliance, you have the epic and exciting Battle of Red Cliffs, where Cao Cao is defeated by these allies. And we discussed this battle in CHP episode 22. Guan Yu was a great military strategist, and no one can doubt his effectiveness. But his military exploits weren't of the magnitude that earned him the kind of accolades as, you know, say, Li Shimin or Zhu Yuanzhang, or even Zhu De. Liu Bei had Zhuge Liang on his side as his master strategist. It was this act of loyalty by Guan Yu, this complete exhibition of what integrity means when he, when, when Guan Yu learns that Liu Bei is still alive, he left all the riches and honors that Cao Cao had bestowed on him. He left it all behind and made this harrowing escape, you know, like a mini odyssey to make his way back to Liu Bei's camp. So he embodies the whole idea of what it means to honor your commitment, exhibit your loyalty, and to be a man of honor. In 219, Liu Bei had made himself emperor of his state of Shu Han. This was the kingdom that was out in the west. And then you had the northern Cao Wei and then the southern state of Wu. Guan Yu's importance to Liu Bei was still strong, but with a guy like Zhuge Liang as your, how shall we say, as your defense minister, it's going to be hard to get credit for one's military exploits. But he was still a tough old guy. Well, not that old, I guess. Only 58 years he still inspired awe in others, and all kinds of amazing feats and exploits are attributed to Guan Yu. One story, and there's so many that are, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to include in this episode, but this one is you know, told and retold, concerns the time Guan Yu was in battle, and someone shot a poison arrow that pierced his arm. As the medics attended to his nasty wound, which in those days, and I guess pretty much until the 19th century, you know, surgery tended to be a, a rather grisly and horrific affair. And as these medics were working on Guan Yu, cutting into his arm and all that stuff, Guan Yu was busy playing cards with his mates and drinking wine and going on about his business with, you know, and using only one hand. You know, as if having someone, you know, cut into your arm and mess with your tendons and muscles and blood vessels was this, you know, normal everyday thing. He remained fearless to the end. And knowing that he had been called out to a dinner and that an ambush awaited him, he still set out alone, you know, daring anybody to do something. And sure enough, he was ambushed, captured, and beheaded. And this is in 219, 220, thereabouts. But this wasn't before Guan Yu was divinely assisted in a magnificent defeat of Cao Cao's army at Fancheng, led by his able general Yu Qin. So Guan Yu, not necessarily known as one of the greatest warriors China produced in 5,000 years, but who nonetheless was always a major force to be reckoned with and knew how to handle a guandao or a, or a halberd. These are these long poles that have some sort of blade uh, or an axe head attached to them. Guan Yu's image is always shown with this long sword in his hand. The red face, the long beard, and the sword. These three main traits associated with Guan Yu's image is how you could always distinguish him. So Guan Yu dies bravely at Maicheng in Hubei, falling to the forces of his one-time ally Sun Quan. And according to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Sun Quan was arrogantly rebuffed by Guan Yu after offering his son in marriage to Guan Yu's daughter. So the insult was just too great for Sun Quan, and ultimately... Sun Quan plots to have Guan Yu killed, and that's just what happens. And then the legend picks up where the life ends. And according to the legend, after he died, a Buddhist master appeared before him, and Guan Yu asked for spiritual guidance. And the master teaches Guan Yu the five precepts, the most basic code of Buddhist ethics. Don't kill, steal, lie, get drunk, or be a sexual deviant. Guan Yu, through learning all this in more detail than I just gave, 
reached enlightenment, and from this point on, he has a close connection in Buddhism. And from this point forward in the Chinese-speaking world, all the way to the present day in the year of the dragon, 2012, Guan Yu is lionized as the ultimate example of loyalty and righteousness. But it's not until the Sui dynasty, which began in 581, 219 years after his death, that Guan Yu is first deified at Yutren Hill in present-day Hubei. That, and here he begins to evolve into the god that is loved and honored in so many segments of Chinese society. The spirit of Guan Yu had first been absorbed into Buddhist beliefs. He's made a bodhisattva and later embraced wholeheartedly by Taoist believers, becoming you know, one of the most important Taoist guardian deities. And lastly, because of Guan Yu's association with learning and wisdom, even the Confucianists venerate him. Guan Yu has many names. He's also referred to commonly as Guan Gong, or Lord Guan. And upon his deification, he became even more well-known as Guan Sheng Di Jun, or the shortened version of Guan Di, or Emperor Guan. And all the while, no matter Buddhism, Taoism, or any Chinese folk religion who honored Guan Yu, they all focused on Guan Yu as the embodiment of honor, loyalty, integrity, justice, courage, and strength. And besides these ideals, he is also associated with learning and wisdom. There are Guan Di temples all over China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and throughout Southeast Asia. And the whole cult of Guan Yu, it even made it big in South Korea and in Japan. If you check my website out for this episode, I snapped a photo of a typical Guan Yu altar inside this gift shop in L.A.'s Chinatown. You'll see Guan Yu in the topmost, most important central position. And I'm sure many of you have passed a few hundred of these in your lifetime. Now let's get back to his death in 219 A.D., The road to deification began with the initial honors that began to be heaped upon Guan Yu. His own state of Shu posthumously made him a Marquis. Towards the end of the Northern Song Dynasty, he was named a Duke and later a Prince. In 1187, during the Southern Song and into the reign of the Mongols in China, Guan Yu received further honors. However, it was during the long, long reign of the Wanli Emperor of the Ming Dynasty that in 1614, Guan Yu was given the title of Saintly Emperor Guan, the great god who subdues demons of the three worlds and whose awe spreads far and moves heaven. And then into the Qing Dynasty, Guan Yu in 1853 is made a Wu Sheng, which officially places him on the same level as no less a sacred cow than Confucius himself. Confucius being the sage or sheng of learning, wen, and Guan Yu being the sheng of war, wu. So he's also called the wu sheng, Confucius being the wen sheng, and again, Guan Yu the wu sheng. And Guan Di and Confucius complemented each other's roles, the great sage representing internal harmony, and Guan Di representing security of the frontiers against external threat. It was usually at the local Guan Di, Guan Gong Temple, wherever in China, where the executioner's sword would be kept until a judge said that it must be used. You see, it came down to the emperor as far as who had the power to deify someone. By 1725, during the time of the Yongzheng emperor, the systematic control of the cult of Guan Di Emperor Guan came under the control of the imperial court. And Guan Di being, you know, the folk deity for loyalty, wealth, literature, protector of temples, patron of actors, secret societies, of course, war, and also a patron saint for restaurants, pawn shops, dealers, and curios. By controlling all this, you were able to project your power beyond the capital and into the smallest hamlet of say, far away Guizhou province. It's ironic that most often Guan Yu is called the indigenous Chinese god of war. He wasn't warlike at all, despite his role in so many key battles leading up to the start of the San Guo Shi Dai, the period of the Three Kingdoms. He was a great proponent of war for the sake of peace, 
fighting for the purpose of defending the people who were helpless against the onslaught of all these warlords, and he made war for the sake of ending war. Not only the underworld gangs honor Guan Yu, but policemen as well. If you walk into, I'd say, any police station in Hong Kong, you'll see some altar or something with Guan Yu's image or a statue. He's the patron saint of the police, just as he is for the triads. After all, loyalty, respect, integrity, and fearlessness are traits very much demanded amongst those criminal elements of society as well as in the police. So Guan Yu is sacred to them too. In a police station, Guan Yu's sword will be in his right hand with the underworld. They show him with the sword or halberd in his left hand. In Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and everywhere in Southeast Asia where Chinese congregate, Guan Yu is worshipped as a god of wealth alongside the Caishan, the other god of wealth. This also goes for uh, in uh, Shanxi province, where Guan Yu came from. So that's uh, Guan Yu, the most well-known example of historical persons who went on to become gods. Guan Yu died almost 1,800 years ago. He lived during the time of the Roman emperors Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, Septimius Severus, Caracalla, you know, that time, you know, for all you History of Rome fans, and who isn't a fan of that podcast? Well, uh, it's 18 centuries later, and Guan Yu lives on. Since his image and his spirit are omnipresent throughout many parts of the Chinese-speaking world, he remains immortal to this day. And that's going to be it for now. Wow, did you hear Levon Helm passed away Thursday? I'm still in mourning. Sorry to see him go. It sure feels like summer here. 90 plus today in Claremont. And next month I have to be in uh, Ningbo, albeit for a very short time. I'm finally going to go and visit that uh, history museum, the Ningbo Bo Wu Guan, designed by architect Wang Shu, winner of this year's Pritzker Prize. He's the first Chinese citizen to win this prestigious award. This museum is about 15, 20 minutes from my factory, so I'm determined to check it out at last after passing it about a thousand times. The Hamutu culture, being local to the region and all, figures prominently, I'm sure, for this. The people of Ningbo are always proud to say that their history is 7,000 years old, which is 40% more than the mere 5,000 years of Chinese history. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. This is Laszlo Montgomery once again signing off without fanfare or outro music. We run a lean operation here and only give you what you're here for. Join us next time. I'm tempted to say next week, but I think those days are over for an indefinite period of time. I already thought about next week's topic. It's going to be another timely one. Take care. Adios, everybody.